Hello, Brother Robert. Hey, how are you, my friend? Welcome to another episode of our live stream, My Journey to the Trinity. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful blessing to have with us today our brother, uh, our brother Robert Spencer, who is always doing interesting things. And um, today I was, uh, I was just very interested in, uh, first of all, you're writing a new book. And uh, uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about that one. Could you just tell us a little bit about the new book? Because we're going to talk about one of your older books <laughs> today. <laughs> but uh, what what is the the new book that you're doing? Because uh, I saw it the other day. I, I looked right now for it. I couldn't find it on the site. Well, you know, things slip down on the site because it's updated frequently. Uh, but you're probably referring to the Critical Quran, which will be That's out in November. Yes. I'm very excited about that. It's uh, a uh, book I'm very happy with and I think is important if I do say so myself. It is uh, the first Quran ever uh, to be honest in the translation. And so when it says Jihada, I translate it Jihad, jihad because uh, people in, 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 in uh, non-Muslims who speak English generally when they're reading the Quran and they see strive hard in the way of Allah, they don't know that that means jihad because they don't know what the Arabic word is that's being used for strive, and they don't know the implications of the striving in Islamic theology. So I say, wage jihad in the way of Allah. And it's not just the translation, but also the notes come from Ibn Kathir, from Qurtubi, from Tafsir al-Jalalain, from all these uh, sources that Muslims consider to be the authoritative explanations of what the Quran is saying. And then there's something else also that has never been in any Quran before. Uh, a lot of times you see it in Bibles, but you've never seen it in a Quran. You'll see a little note in a Bible and it'll say, other manuscripts say this instead of that. Mm -hmm. And it's got text differences. Variants. Quran in textual variants, exactly. In the Quran, you never see those in any edition of the Quran because Muslims don't believe they exist and insist that there are no. Yeah. textual variations that it's every copy is exactly the same as every other copy because it was miraculously preserved by Allah for 1400 years and the reality is is that there are quite a lot of textual differences in various manuscripts this is the first Quran to give you those to many many of the passages so uh, it's it's I think a uh, book going to be very uh, exciting to see, I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. I mean, in the sense that seeing it, uh, yeah, it is fifty dollars. I'm sorry about that, but it's going to be. It's a very big book. Uh, I think you'll find that it's worth the money. The publisher sets the price. I did not have control over that, but uh, like I say, I think this is going to. This is worth it. It's not like any other Quran that's out there, and it gives you information that you're not going to find anywhere else. I've even got two Shiite surahs that uh, are not generally in the canonical Quran. Another thing you often, often find in Bibles is that there will be an appendix with the Apocrypha, books that uh, the Catholic Church accepts, that Protestants don't, or other books that were written around the same time that some churches have found to be canonical and others not. Uh, and this is the first Quran to have that. A couple of Shiite surahs that uh, were in some Shiite editions of the Quran, but are generally not considered to be part of the canonical text. The thing is, uh, the reasons why they're not part of the canonical text can also be applied to a lot of the parts of the Quran that are in there that everybody accepts. So it's uh, it's very interesting. And so you got that. That's coming in November. Okay. I wish it were coming tomorrow. It's all said. It's all written. It's all done. Uh, but like I said, I haven't seen it typeset yet. I'm looking forward to that and uh, looking forward to being able to share it with you. Uh, wow. Meanwhile, yes, this is not really an old book. Um, so Steve, this is issued, right? uh, Did Muhammad Exist is a new edition, revised and expanded, 25% new material, uh, answers to objections, new uh, findings that support the uh, fact that Muhammad is more myth and legend than, than historical reality. Uh, all kinds of interesting things in this book as well. That's available for pre-order now also uh, at all the usual suspects. Amazon, if you don't want to deal with Amazon on moral grounds, I am 100% with you. 
And uh, it's also available at Barnes and Noble. If you don't want to deal with Barnes and Noble on moral grounds, I am 100% with you. And so there are other sources where you can order both Did Muhammad Exist, Revised and Expanded Edition, and the Critical Quran, even as we speak. Don't go now because you'll miss this extraordinary discussion. But uh, otherwise, uh, as, soon as, as soon as we're done here, uh, an hour and a few, then go and uh, uh, order these books you will not regret it. You will find that they will give you some information on the origins of Islam and the teachings of Islam uh, and the uh, strange story of how Islam came about that uh, most people don't know and uh, most Muslims don't want to admit. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I got to say, I'm sitting outside on my patio because the nice. internet... Is better here, but man, I really like this, man. It's almost like one of those, you know, those Google backgrounds that you... <laughs> yeah, it looks good. I was actually thinking, oh, you know, I should have had the bright idea to, to do a show outside, but I think it might be too windy today. Anyway. Well, it's it's really beautiful out here. Of course, it's Southern California, so it's beautiful. And uh, man, I didn't realize that. I really like the, the, the ceiling here. It gives, it gives you that depth and... Uh, gothic feeling a little bit but anyway <laughs> it all looks great it's terrific <laughs> well uh brother robert um uh, you know i actually this interview was from shabir uh shabir ali yes what, did it did it uh, you may have already seen it and may have already well, I, responded to it i uh, saw it years ago i have never uh publicly responded to it as as far as i recall anyway uh, I'm happy to have the chance to do so now. Yeah. I, I remember years ago I was thinking, oh, I should do a response to that. And then you know how things happen. You get busy with other things and let it slip. And then it seemed like, well, it's old now. But now that the book is coming out again, uh, yeah. uh, it's good to say hello to old Shabir. And, yeah. uh, well, you, you know, when I did when I listened to the uh, when I listened to the video about the uh, their response to you, I thought, dude, there's a couple of points in this that it'd be really nice to get Robert. And I was going to chop it up and just give yeah. you responses, but you know what? The whole thing is about you. <laughs> so I was thinking it's only like 13 minutes long. We can okay. look the parts of it. And then as we come to a particular thing, we'll go ahead and have you respond to it. But he says something very amazing at the beginning of this that, uh, that I, I really would like to get your response to. Okay. So, Anyway, for those of you guys who are with us who maybe don't know exactly what we're doing today, I'm, uh, Brother Robert is putting out a book called Did Muhammad Exist? It's actually a reissue because he, he did it before. It's not a reissue. It is a new book, revised and expanded. See that? Revised okay. and expanded edition. If you have the old one, you do not have everything okay. that is in this one. <laughs> anyway, this interview that with uh, Shabir Ali and his daughter, uh, on his program is about the the book done before, and uh, but the the issues within it are still relevant in this book too. So I just wanted to have Brother Robert here to respond to some of the stuff that Shabir Ali said. So I'm going to go ahead and put on the video. Uh, it's only like 13 minutes. I'm just going to play little bits and pieces, and and we'll just stop it as we come to a particular point where. I feel like Brother Robert would, uh, should respond to because <laughs> he says stuff about you. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyway, and then there's also... Um, I love him too, my friend. <laughs> some, you know what? He, there's this new approach in Islam evangelism, which is you talk real nice, you talk real slow, real softly, and he's like, calm down, calm down, you know, don't, don't, don't get excited, you know, and they're, they're trying to do that, you know. And you That's just, probably a reaction to... Those those louts like Muhammad Hijab and what's yeah. that other fellow, the Andalusian guy, Asadullah, that they, they just heap abuse and insults and they think that they're winning an argument. Uh, uh, Mubin Sheikh, guys like that. So I can understand why there'd be a reaction and people thinking, well, this this approach isn't working. Let's try to be nicer. Yes. Well, you know what? The Ali Dawa is also the one who says, "Yeah, he's another we one." Should be killed. That apostate should be killed. Then we'll be watching. We'll be watching. And I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, the uh, uh, that, oh, there's something else I wanted to. Uh, uh, okay. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and start playing it. I'm going to start it from the beginning, and then I'll I'll stop it because there's one point he makes right at the beginning that I just thought, dude, rock and roll. 
Uh, anyway, so I'll go ahead and put it on here. So. Muhammad exists. An inquiry. Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My name is Sophia. I'm your host. The aim of Let the Quran Speak is to help you gain deeper insights into Muslims and Islam as it's practiced here and in other parts of the world. Did Muslims invent Muhammad? That's the subject of a book by Robert Spencer entitled Did Muhammad Exist? An inquiry into Islam's obscure origins. Spencer claims Muhammad was a myth, a political invention created much later to serve the needs of an expanding empire. Are his claims true? Here to assess them, Dr. Shabir Ali, president of the Islamic Information Center. But the Shabir, what does it mean if, if Spencer's claims are true? Does this call into question the basis of Islam and Islamic belief? Yes, of course, in a very big way. If, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not exist, then um, there, there's not, no reason to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. and okay, that was the... Uh, when I heard him say that, I said, whoa! You know, because, I mean, I've heard you, I've heard Jay Smith talk about this, but I didn't really think about the implications of what you're saying. But here Shabir Ali says, it's like, if he didn't exist, then what's the purpose of being a Muslim? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. what, do you, what do you think about what he just said there? Well, I think that might be the only thing on which Shabir Ali and I agree. That this, the implications of this are huge. And people have said to me, that uh, this book is pointless because yeah. Muslims are believe that he existed and they're going to act on his existing, and this isn't going to change that. And that's obviously true for most. However, any anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, who really considers the evidence presented in the book is going to realize that Muhammad is a myth, not a fact, and that's that could change people's lives. And there. Uh, there are people who have told me what a big difference that it made to them when they discovered this. Mohammed Sven Kalic was uh, a convert to Islam in Germany, and he was a professor of Islamic studies. And he started to do the same uh, inquiries that I did, and he discovered that Muhammad was not historical, and he left Islam. Wow. And so you think about what could happen if this became widespread. Unfortunately, you know, I a couple times tried to get an Arabic translation of this book, of the first edition of this book, and uh, the translations were subpar and didn't, didn't work out, but I'd still love to see that. I think if this book were circulating in Arabic, it could uh, create some shockwaves. Wow. Uh, I think it's going to create shockwaves anyway, and uh, wow. But, uh, I mean, I was... I was blown away because, I mean, I've heard about this, but I didn't really think about the implications of it. But when Shabir Ali says that, Shabir Ali himself says that, he says, what's the purpose of being a Muslim if Muhammad didn't exist? I'm like, yep. dude, oh my gosh. All right, let's go ahead and put it on. He's, he's, gonna, he's got some more jewels here. So. <laughs> in fact, uh, the Quran would be um, one of the most massive fakes in all of uh, history. In, the in yes. fact, the Quran would be one of the most massive fakes in all of history. That's what it is, Shabir. Get the, uh, get the book, The Critical Quran, and you'll see that that is indeed exactly what it is. Actually, there's a, there's a good bit of that in Did Muhammad Exist uh, about the Quran as well, that the Quran, for example, uh, in, is supposed to have been collected in the year 653 by Uthman, the caliph, who uh, uh, br brought together all the people who'd memorized parts of the Quran, codified the text, burned all the variants, and distributed the Quran to the provinces, the Islamic provinces, 653. Okay, if that happened, then why did this happen? 653, 663, 673, 683, 693. Years and years go by, and nobody mentions the Quran. Nobody quotes it. Nobody says it exists. There's not a single contemporary reference to the Quran for 40 years after it's supposed to have been collected. Not only that, but in the early 700s, even later, 50, 60 years now, after the Quran is supposed to have been collected, you've got John of Damascus, the Christian writer, recognized as a saint in the church. And John of Damascus is the first Christian to write about Islamic doctrine and the Quran. But you know, one of the strange things that he says, Steve, is I've read your books, I've read your Quran, and I've read Surah al-Baqarah. Now see, think about that for a minute. Would you ever speak that way? 
which Surat al-Baqara, I'm sure that you, everybody who's watching this knows, but just in case, is the second chapter of the Quran, the chapter the of the cow. Yeah, the longest chapter of the Quran. The longest and the most important, really, because it's full of it's full of core Islamic doctrines. But it, it, would you ever say, I've read Tom Sawyer, and I've read chapter 8 of Tom Sawyer. Oh. <laughs> you see what I mean? If you've read Tom Sawyer, you've read Tom Sawyer. If you've read the Quran, you've read Surah Al-Baqarah. So why does he have to single that out? Unless maybe it wasn't actually part of the Quran yet. Oh. That's the only way that makes sense of his speaking in that way. Wow. And there are all kinds of other indications. For example, people say, well, you've got the, the inscriptions on the wall of the Dome of the Rock. And I discussed those at length and did Muhammad exist also. The inscriptions on the wall of the Dome of the Rock are all Quran, except they're not. They're Quran, most of it, but then there's some phrases that are not Quran. And so you got to think about why would somebody who's writing on the wall of the Dome of the Rock, not just writing like graffiti, but he's carving, he's, he's making a beautiful inscription that's going to last now for 1,400 years. And he has this holy book, the Quran, in front of him. And he takes some quotes from here and some quotes from there, some quotes from chapter 2, some quotes from chapter 5, some quotes from chapter 9, some quotes from chapter 61, and he mixes them all together. Now, in the first place, why would he do that? Usually, if you're quoting a book, you might take a section from here and a section from there, but you would also label where it's from. But to just mix it all up and put in some things that weren't in the book at all, it's very strange behavior. It's much easier to understand that the, the wall inscriptions came first and then some of those quotes were put into the Quran when it was being put together. You see, it's just what makes sense. For example, yet another thing. There's an Islamic tradition. This is an Islamic tradition, Steve. It's not something Spencer made up or Jay Smith or, uh, or anybody else. The Islamic tradition, and it says, uh, has an old man saying, we never read the Quran until the time of, in the mosques, until the time of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was governor of Iraq in the 680s and 690s and early 700s. So it's 50, 60 years after Muhammad. And this old guy is saying, we never read the Quran in the mosques until Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Now, if they had the Quran in the 650s, why wouldn't they be reading it until the 690s? Unless maybe they didn't really have it until the 690s. And they, put, they, they said when they were selling it to the people, they said, this is the holy book that, uh, what, you haven't gotten a copy yet? Well, here you go. We, we've had this for 40 years since Uthman gave it to us, you see, because that gives it an air of authenticity. That's another, there's another story too, Steve, before we go back to Shabir. Uh, Abdul Malik, who was the caliph of the Muslims at the time of, oh, excuse me, Abdul Malik, who was the caliph at the time that Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was governor of Iraq. Abdul Malik, said in another Islamic tradition, I'm afraid I'm going to die during Ramadan because I was born during Ramadan, I became caliph during Ramadan, and I collected the Quran during Ramadan. Now think about that. He was caliph from 685 to 705, and he's saying he collected the Quran. He doesn't seem to be aware that Uthman collected the Quran 40 years before. And see... If you say, okay, Abdul Malik collected the Quran, and he said it was Uthman's to make it look appear like it was ancient and authentic, that makes sense. But if you say, no, Uthman collected the Quran and it had been around for 40 years, then why would Abdul Malik say he did it? That doesn't make any sense. You see what I mean? You know, you know this makes me think of, uh, of other things that don't make sense in the... And this is in the in the Muslim sources about yeah. how, how that you know the Battle of Yamama where Abu Bakr said, "Okay, we need to uh, everybody's dying, so we need to collect the Quran before we lose the Quran too." And yep. Omar, Omar says, "No, you can't do it." And then this guy says, "You can." And this and then Allah opens the hearts and everything. And Zaid ibn Thabit does. But the interesting thing for me out of that whole story, and you guys, 
this is all in your in your text. Don't don't think I'm making any of this up. This is all in the text, in the sunnah, in the hadith. And is that uh, is that what happened to the Quran after they compiled it? It was just put under a bed for however many years until later on they they, they come near to having a civil war and then Uthman says, okay, go get it. Go get it from Hafsa because it was in with Hafsa and let's do something with it, you know? Yeah. And it's just kind and of what, strange. That's all in this book too. And it wasn't just that Uthman said, go get it. Uh -huh. He got Zayd and Tabit back. Yeah. And he told him to do the job again. Yeah. Why would he do that? And Zayd never says, hey, wait a minute, it's under Hafsa's bed. I did this 20 years ago. He never says that. What we have here is a duplication of traditions. We have it happening when Abu Bakr is caliph, and then we have it happening again when Uthman is caliph, and nowhere in the stories that sets it in Uthman's time do they say this was already done during the time of Abu Bakr. But it's the same story because people are dying. Uth the, the caliph says, you better do this because we're going to lose the Quran. Zaid is called in to do it. Zaid says, I don't want to do it because Muhammad didn't do it. And yes. they tell him, you have to do it because we're going to lose the Quran. And he agrees. And he goes around and collects all the people's, all the various chapters that people have memorized. And he puts them together. Now, look, Steve, why didn't he say when Uthman told him to do this, we've been through this before and I already did it. And it's under Hafsa's bed. The yeah. stories are exactly the same, except yeah. for one of them is set 20 years later. It's because they're both myths. They're both stories that were written long after the fact. And one of them put it in the time of Abu Bakr and one of them put it in the time of Uthman. Like maybe somebody came up with the story that Uthman had done it and somebody said, no, that's too late. That's already 20 years after Muhammad. Let's set it in the time of Abu Bakr just two years after Muhammad, you see? And uh, because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. Why wouldn't Zaid, the same guy, who collects the Quran both times, remind Uthman that it had already been done and uh, go get the old copy instead wow. of doing the whole thing again. The, you, the, the fact is that the stories we're talking about, there is no sign of their existence. Nobody quotes them. Nobody refers to them. Nobody has them until the ninth century. And that is 200 years after Muhammad. So the idea that this is the real story of how the Quran was collected, well, look, if I told you that all that we know about the War of 1812 is what's being written now, and we have no record of it before this, then you would think, well, maybe we can't trust these records because it's 200 years later. People don't even remember there was a War of 1812. How are we going to know any of this is accurate? You know, you know, you know. If that happened, Chris Como would do a an exclusive, you know, about that. But <laughs> you, you know, what's interesting to me also is if you think about these stories about the compilation of Quran, is that they involve the first three caliphs. Yes. It has Abu Bakr, it has Omar, and it has uh, Uthman, and it also has uh, Hafsa, who's the the widow of Muhammad. So you bring in all these very big heavyweights. Yes. Uh, into this story. You know, yes, and there's another. There, there are all sorts of stories in Islamic tradition that people point to to say, "Look, see, they had the Quran. They knew the Quran." One of them is when Ali was fighting with Muawiyah over the caliphate in the. It was at the first fitna in uh, uh, around the year 658 60, and they put the Quran on their spears to show that they're fighting for Allah. Well, in the first place, the story is completely preposterous because in those days, every Quran had to be printed out by hand. If you had a copy, it was a precious thing. You're not going to put it out on a battlefield and risk, in the first place, having it desecrated with blood, with mud, with whatever else, and you're not going to risk losing it. It's wow. a valuable object. And so these stories are, are, are clearly the uh, product of a later time that's mythologizing about the origins of Islam. But what's weirdest about this whole business is that contemporary historians take it seriously. Yeah. And I've got in Did Muhammad Exist, the story, for example, there's a contemporary historian, Gregor Scholler, very well respected, and he's talking about Urwa ibn Zubair, the first uh, historian of Muhammad's life, 
And he says, we can trust these traditions that are attributed to him because he heard them from his aunt Aisha, Muhammad's wife. And so it's going straight to the source. And I think, well, you know, oh, that sounds very impressive. Wow. Him. He heard it from Aisha and he wrote it down, except we don't have any writings from Urwa. We don't have any. All we have are Hadith from the ninth century that are attributed to him. Yeah. So how do we know that they haven't been changed multiply from the time that, uh, that he actually is supposed to have lived? Wow. Dude, that I just oh, it, 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 it's, you know what I'm thinking, and I maybe you've already done this. I don't, I'm not sure if you have, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking that there, there needs to be a book about the Dome of the Rock, and about the inscriptions in it. You know, well, in here there's a there's a there's a quite a lot of information about the Dome of the Rock inscriptions, okay. and uh, how they where how they relate to the Quran, how it looks as if they came first rather than that they were the sort they were not using the Quran as the source, but they were the source for the Quran, and so on. And, it, you know, it's, it, it, I'm just putting this out there, you know, as an ex-Muslim and, and a Palestinian who's been to the Dome of the Rock 800 times, because I always, always had to take my dad there, you know, he wanted to pray at Al-Aqsa, I used to always have to take him up in the wheelchair, put him in Al-Aqsa, and then go down to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre until prayer was over and come back. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, they, and they knew I wasn't a uh, Muslim, too. But, uh, you know, uh, what this makes me think of it is the idea that that building was was seriously just an affront to the deity of Jesus Christ. It was to say that Jesus is not the Son of God and on yeah. a location higher than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's another thing, Steve. The Dome of the Rock, 691, is the first appearance of the phrase that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And you have in 691, the inscriptions that say that. And yet when you read that inscription, the whole thing talks about, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Um, the whole thing talks about Jesus after it says that. And so you gotta wonder, why would they do that? Why would they not go on about Muhammad? Why would they not go on about how he got the Quran or uh, uh, got the, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, it's actually, I'm not sure it's the very first, but it is in there. And look, this is how it goes. Um, okay, here we go. Muhammad is the servant of God and his messenger, right? That's a, actually a variant of the profession of faith, the Shahada. It's not exactly how it goes. And so you gotta wonder, if they're saying all the time, there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his messenger, why don't they say it that way on the Dome of the Rock? Unless maybe they formulated the phrase later. Well, you know, uh, you know, Robert, I just, just, I don't wanna go off track here, but I just wanna tell you that four days ago, I did a video about so many Shahadas, there's so many of them, and, and so many of them, I mean this in the Hadith, I have yeah. them. I, I could put them on right now. They yeah. say, uh, uh, and Jesus is the son of Mary, the word of Allah, and his spirit. There you go. In the Shahadas. Yeah. That's, so, uh, yeah. But look, I just want to say very briefly here, I won't read the whole thing, but it says, Muhammad is the servant of God and his messenger. And then it goes on, O people of the book, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning God, save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was only a messenger of, of Allah and his word, which he conveyed unto Mary in the spirit. Like I was saying, why don't they talk about Muhammad? Why don't they talk about the Quran? Why don't they talk about Islam? Instead, it's only all the rest of it is all about how Jesus is not God and is not the savior. So it is much more likely that that first sentence is also about Jesus. That when it says Muhammad is his messenger, they mean the praised one, that is Jesus, is only a messenger of Allah, not the not the son of Allah. Okay. And so that would make sense of the whole thing, that the whole thing is a Christian, a, a, a heretical Christian group that believed that Jesus is not the son of God and that this later became part of Islam. Wow. <laughs> Dude. Okay. Oh, wow. Dude, blowing my mind here. Yeah, it is. This is fun stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and, because uh, you yeah. still got a couple of rubies here that I'd like to uh, get out. Back to Shabir. 
<laughs> Back to Shabir. <clears throat> okay. Literature. Uh, but of course, this claim is not true. All right. <laughs> Explain that. Why is it not true? Well, yeah, first of all, we should. Uh, uh, I mean, it, every Muslim knows that Muhammad existed. Okay. I wanted to okay. stop there. Every Muslim knows that Muhammad yeah. existed. So you see, his daughter said, okay, tell us why. Why is what he said not true? And he says, well, everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah. That's his first response. Yeah, so, true. in other words, he ain't got no response because if he did, he would have led with it. Yeah. The strongest argument against what's being said. Instead, all he can say is, well, it's obvious. Everybody knows. But, uh, when David Wood, you know, David Wood actually believes that Muhammad existed and yeah. that this is all some crazy conspiracy theory. But David Wood actually and I, uh, years ago when the first edition came out, debated Anjum Chowdhury and Omar Bakri, the famous uh, imams who were then in uh, Britain, Omar Bakri was uh, actually, he left the country and was not let back in not long after that, but uh, they said, they both said it the same kind of way really, of course Muhammad existed it's in the Quran <laughs> well, That's popular. okay then mm -hmm. yes wow, yeah, when he said that you see, because this reminds me you know, this reminds me of the arguments that you're always getting, it, it, it's, there's no actual basis there's no uh, there's no evidence or proof it's just oh of course everybody knows it and it's just like what so anyway yeah. it's funny when he said that so let's hear what he says here so. and uh, it's common uh, knowledge that the it's common knowledge there was a man yeah. named Muhammad who is the founder of the Islamic religion even mm -hmm. among non-muslims uh, but so we should now be asking the reverse question why does this man think that Muhammad did not exist and that Muslims invented him mm -hmm. and are there other people who think that because he claims to be building on scholarly sources um, that exist. So what is he referring yes. to? In, in every field of inquiry, there, there is a mainstream scholarship, and then there is fringe scholarship. Okay, the word here, the new word that he introduces is fringe. Yes. He's going to use this a lot now. So, uh, Yeah, the thing is, there, you know, it's just name-calling. <laughs> he still hasn't given us a single reason why Muhammad existed. Yeah. And all he's doing is saying, the scholars who say Muhammad didn't exist are fringe, that is, they're bad. And the scholars who say he did exist, they're mainstream, that is, they're good. Yeah. You see? That's all it is. He hasn't given us any reason to believe what he says. Well, you know, you know what? I've watched I've watched many of these of, of his programs. He never does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm still not sure if I'm supposed to be killed or not about, about apostates being killed. It's just like, uh, absolutely not. Well, maybe, you know, just like yeah. sometimes, well, if he does this, if he does it with his right foot in the air or something, <laughs> I don't know. Man. He knows. He just doesn't want everybody else to know. Yeah, because you got to talk real, real nice, get people real soft, and get people, you know, make them yeah. look radicals while you're, okay. <laughs> Mainstream scholarship on, um, on Islam. Main Street scholarship on Islam. Uh, there it would, is. Uh, include Muslim mainstream scholarship, but it will also mainstream. include uh, non-Muslim mainstream scholarship. So, in other so words, you see what he's saying. It's just like if you said, uh, "There's there, the, his scholars are red and mine are blue," yeah. and the, the red scholars say this, therefore it must be. It does. It's a meaningless thing. Mainstream fringe. You know, when uh, Galileo first said that the. Uh, the, the earth revolved around the sun. Wasn't that his thing? Uh, he was fringe. He was, yeah. You know, uh, the, whether something is mainstream or fringe doesn't mean anything in terms of whether or not it's true. Yeah. You, you know, one thing that I'm, that I'm expecting to see now, and I, I expect us to see this from Saudi Arabia, even though I don't, even though I'm so happy with Saudi Arabia lately, I, I just, I love, I love uh, Ben Salman and what he's doing. But expect I expect them to say, "Ah, oh, we discovered we discovered this coin, and it says Muhammad Rasulullah, or something." You know, just to kind of because they're going to be reacting to this. You know, to I say, wouldn't be surprised. Sure, yeah. um, but anyway, okay. Uh, Europeans who have uh, studied the, the religions of the East and uh, cultures and civilizations of the East, 
uh, you'll have uh, a, a stream of academic scholars who have been studying Islam for a couple of hundred years now. And uh, uh, they have developed sort of consensus, uh, an idea about how, how Islam originated and developed and, and eventually uh, reached the uh, stage that we know now to be Islam. And, and they generally say that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did exist. He was a historical person, but that Muslims made more of him than he actually was. And they invented things, put things in his mouth, and so on, in terms of the Hadith collections. But when it comes to the Quran, uh, a certain scholar, Theodore Noldek, uh, from more than 100 years ago, uh, you, have you heard of this Theodore Noldek or whatever? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, I, I use his work in Did Muhammad Exist? He's a, an eminent historian. I wouldn't trust Shabir Ali to tell me what Theodore Noldek uh, actually said, okay. but uh, the, because in the first place, the he's, he's kind of temporizing, as he always does, Shabir. He's saying that uh, the, the most of these, these reputable scholars, the red ones, not the blue ones, they uh, believe that Muhammad did exist, but that Muslims have exaggerated what he actually said and did. Now that's not actually granting anything because even the Hadith scholars, Bukhari, Muslim, they collected, uh, like Bukhari collected 600,000 Hadith, supposedly, and rejected 593,000 as inauthentic. So all he's saying is exactly what Muslims have said throughout history, that most of the Hadith are fabricated, that Muslims have exaggerated what Muhammad said and did. but the real question is, well, what about the other 7,000? I would say Bukhari was right. The 593,000 were inauthentic, but so were the other 7,000. Uh, there's no basis for believing that they were any stronger in uh, historical validity than the others. And uh, anyway, the, what the, Theodore Noldek does a lot of good work in regard to the origins of Islam and the meaning of the Quran in various obscure passages. Uh, so if he's going to be thoroughgoing about invoking him, he's going to end up denying parts of his faith. Wow. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and hear what he has to say. And, and you know, I'm going to have to get, get your opinion about King Muhammad, I mean, uh, Crown Prince Muhammad Salman and what he's doing, but we'll do that at the end. So, uh, Describe the collection of the Quran in the time of Uthman, the third caliph of Islam, as uh, basically authentic and that uh, many different readings of the Quran are known, and they all go back to that uh, core book, which was... Okay, many readings of the Quran are known, and they all go back to the Uthmani. That's kind of what he... Okay, yeah. great, but where's the Uthmani Quran? It doesn't exist. People, he's, he, the people assume that the 1924 Cairo edition, which has been distributed all around the world by the Saudis and others, is the Uthmanic Quran, and they claim that it is, but actually he's right. There are many traditions that have variant texts, and they're all claiming to go back to the Uthmanic Quran. Even in Islamic tradition, as you know, they're the, very, they're the different readers who uh, recite the Quran in different ways, which is, seems to me to be some, a, a way to try to explain away the fact that there are variants. Yeah. And the, the 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 Muhammad got the Quran in seven dialects and so on. Uh, but the difficulty that he has is that there is no Uthmanic Quran. Mm -hmm. He cannot pay, point to any Quran and say, "Here's the original text." That does uh, there is no original text, and there's quite a lot of a lot more variation than people realize uh, in the manuscript. Uh, promulgated in the time of the third caliph Uthman and this was within two decades after the death of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so the Quran is authentic uh, though not all hadiths are authentic see right there he just dropped in this bomb this nuclear bomb he just dropped that in like oh yeah oh by the way yeah the Quran is authentic yeah he doesn't have any evidence of Uthman's Quran yeah but he doesn't have but he's sorry saying, go ahead He's saying this according to that historian. What was that historian's name? Oh, Noldek, yeah. Yeah, he, he's saying that according to Noldek, the Quran is authentic. So there he just, you know, took this off the table. He put this outside. Yeah. So, so, so don't touch the Quran, you know, because Noldek says that it's authentic, you know. And so that yeah, the people who say that it comes from uh, that, the, that uh, you have Uthman's Quran, they don't know. Uh, either they don't know or they're not being honest because, like I said, there is no 
Uthman's Quran. And then he goes back to saying, but some of the Hadith are inauthentic, which is I explained, that's a very commonplace statement. That's easy for Muslims to allow because they've always acknowledged that. Yeah. Well, you, you know what? There, he, he's done this twice. In just a few minutes that we've talked, he's done this twice already. Number one, he said, um, he said the, uh, um, uh, well, dude, my brain just went, uh, went to sleep. You know, oh, everybody knows that Muhammad existed. Uh, all, yeah. Everybody knows. So that way you took that off the table. You know, the number one. Yes. Subject. And, then and the, he still never, he did, gave no evidence. No evidence. But he says that settles that, you know, because everybody knows it. And then with this, uh, he, he's blaming Noldek for the authenticity of the Quran. <laughs> yeah. anyway, so, all right, let's hear what he's got. He, he's got some jewels here. Let's see. So the hadith collections would have. So the Quran isn't something that was invented later on. It was something that you know is actually from the time that Muslims claim it to be. Exactly. Okay. Oh, so, hold on, no. Steve. Can we stop there for a second? Yeah, but please. I, I want to say that all he's the only. Have, okay, there have been two questions. One is, like you said, did did Muhammad exist? And he says everybody knows that. So he's given no evidence for that. Second. Is the Quran authentic? And all he's given is Theodor Noldica saying it's authentic, which maybe he said, maybe he didn't. I don't know offhand. But the point is, is that that is what is called in logic an argument from authority. An argument from an author from authority is the weakest of all arguments. If I say that uh, this is this is uh, X is Y because Theodor Noldica or Shabir Ali said it. That's the weakest argument I can give you, the weakest reason for you to believe. If I give you evidence that, well, uh, uh, God exists because you, you can't, nothing comes from nothing and you can't have an uncaused first cause and so on, th that makes sense. And it's not an argument from an authority. If I say God exists because Shabir Ali says so, that's an argument from authority. The first arguments are strong. The second argument is weak. All he's given us for the second, for his claim that the Quran is authentic is that this German scholar says so. And he, uh, that's kind of a little bit what he did with the first thing, you know, everybody knows it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. The authority is everybody. Yes. Everybody, everybody yeah. knows it. So it must be true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's mainstream scholarship. Mm -hmm. mainstream, mainstream scholarship. That, those mm -hmm. words are, yeah, but he's, he's going to put you back in the fringe in a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In this case, uh, there is a confluence of Muslim and non Muslim scholarship. The difference There's a big word confluence, okay? Muslim and non Islamic scholars. So it's not just the Muslim saying this. Prince no, it's a conflict. Muslim scholarship would insist that the Quran was collected not only in the time of Uthman, but even before that, during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, mm -hmm. and that Uthman just simply made copies and sent them out to various parts of the Muslim Empire. So there, he's he's making mm -hmm. another story here, that it was already collected, and all Uthman did was make copies and send it all over the place, and so. It's, so that's that's see that's what he has to do because of what I was talking about before that the traditions about the collection of the Quran are duplicated, and that you have one set that say it was a time it happened during Abu Bakr's time and the other set saying it happened during Uthman's time. But the problem he's got, what he's not telling you is, like I said, the collection, the stories about Uthman collecting it don't just say he got the copy from Abu Bakr and distributed it. It says that he got Zayd ibn Tabit and Zayd went through with everybody and got the right text and so on. And so he can't explain that if it was already done during Abu Bakr's time. And there's another, just two things really quickly about Uthman's compilation. He says, if there's any question or doubt, just put it in the Qureshi dialect, because that's the original. I mean, he said that to Zayd ibn Thabit. He yeah. said, if there's any doubt about something, just put it in the Qureshi dialect. I'm meaning that there's going to be some, there's something there. And then there's the other issue that the number one caught it, you know, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, don't trust Zayd's collection. Don't do this. Stick with my Quran, not his. That's right. And so you got all these issues in the books, man. It yes. Just, and not only that, why was any of the Quran not in the Qureshi dialect? If Muhammad was a Qureshi and he's the guy who got it all, then why wasn't it all in the Qureshi dialect? Why would there have been any piece of the Quranic revelation that came to Muhammad that had been altered? Because it would have had to have been altered. Muhammad was a Qureshi, right? Yeah. So if Muhammad existed and Muhammad got the Quran, it was all Qureshi. Yeah. So if any of the Quran was not in the Qureshi dialect, it had been changed. Wow. 
All right. Well, we got some some more jewelry coming up here. Nevertheless, even if the European consensus is correct, European consensus. This is a European consensus <laughs> that uh, the Quran that we have now goes back to the Caliph Uthman. <laughs> <clears throat> To Muslims, this is still dependable because this is still dependable, mashallah. Said now we have a book which was put into writing by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Because within two decades of his death, we have not only Uthman who was a companion, but Zaid who is said to have uh, headed the commission to collect the pieces and put them together as the Quran. He's a Steve, companion wait. of the Prophet. And okay. He says we have Uthman collecting the Quran within two decades of Muhammad's death. We don't have that. What we have are stories from 200 years later saying that within two decades of Muhammad's death, the Quran was collected by Uthman. We don't have any contemporary evidence, none, no seventh century evidence that Uthman actually collected the Quran. Wow. Um, I just want hey, to- Hey, Matt, thanks. Thank you, Matt. How you do doing? Uh, do you know him? I do not. Okay. Maybe uh, I saw that he says, I hope we can get to meet in person someday. I hope so. I hate traveling with a mask. I've done it a couple times now uh, on airplanes. It's it's lousy. I'm hoping that they will end that. But of course, uh, you never know these days how the society is going to go. Yeah. Uh, let's hope for better days. But anyway, yes, onward. He's a he's a great. He goes he goes and preaches to Muslims in the mosques and stuff. Oh, but, excellent. Yeah. So, God bless you. More power to you. Yeah. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the dude, there's so much I, I, I want. <laughs> Go ahead and listen to uh, Shabir here because he's gonna, dude, he he's gonna make some. He's gonna say some stuff, man, that just unbelievable. But anyway, let's listen. This was done in the presence of many, many other known uh, and respectable companions of the Prophet peace be upon him. So it will be. You see, this was done in front of many of the known respected companions of the prophet the known respected companion said that don't follow it they uh, this yes. you know, Allah bin Mas'ud said don't follow Zid's Quran stick with mine you know that's right but <laughs> so, all this is all that's ninth century stories there uh, are no seventh century accounts about that okay so how do we know any of it happened at all wow okay <laughs> Like the equivalent of saying we have a book which was put together by the remaining 11 disciples of Jesus and add Matthias to make it 12. So these 12 disciples put together this document so we know that this is, these are the teachings of Jesus because the disciples wouldn't lie. They're telling us firsthand what they saw Jesus say and do. Mm -hmm. Now see uh, this, Shabir, have... he's right about that because you do have manuscript evidence and quotations from other people that indicate that you do have the New Testament documents within a few decades after Jesus's death and resurrection. You don't have anything like that in Islam. You only have stories that come from much later that say that within a few decades after you have the uh, the the Quran. But there's the, like I say, there's no sign of it at the time. Wow. Okay, he's he's going to get really really bad right now. <laughs> Uh, in, in the Islamic context now, something similar, which now the European scholars say we have, European a book which scholars, was composed by European com scholars. companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, within that, that early period, uh, then, and, and they themselves also being careful not to record what they thought and what they would like to write, but uh, to just simply recollect what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught them, and to put them in this book, and this is the book of God, well then, to Muslims, this is quite dependable. And that's the mainstream scholarship. So you, you mentioned Jesus, and, mm -hmm. and, and the question is, how does, how does uh, the historical record about Muhammad, about the Quran and Islam, because they're all related, how does that relate to the historical record of other uh, religious figures, perhaps, or of other historical important events? Well, if we, if we think of the prophet Jesus, then, um, uh, let's think about what Robert Spencer himself um, describes. Uh, he, he talks about the uh, historical inquiry into the life of Jesus and so on, and he's mm -hmm. asking, well, why couldn't we make the same kind of inquiry about the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Mm -hmm. And he's right. Well, why should the prophet Muhammad be excluded from this kind of historical inquiry? We should investigate everybody, the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, <coughs> uh, Krishna, uh, anyone. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you know what? Uh, for all the baloney he says, 
you know, I'm kind of glad that he said that because that really, it's not that you need permission from the Muslim world to do what you're doing, but it's almost like he's given it, you know? Yes. And, and, it, and, uh, and he already gave the value of it when he said that if Muhammad didn't exist, why be Muslim? So anyway, so. Uh, who is taken to be a, a revered or a holy figure or an important person uh, to be emulated and followed. Uh, our historical curiosity should take us there. We want to find out who were these persons before somebody made them into a myth or into a hero. Uh, so, so the inquiry, uh, the, the inquiring, to have an inquiring mind is, is, uh, is a good thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the results of all inquiry uh, are, are beneficial or dependable. Uh, sometimes people take their research in directions, that perhaps, sometimes they're motivated by personal interest, uh, which takes them beyond uh, the uh, confines of uh, uh, academic disinterest and, and neutrality and objectivity. And this there, there, that was a big, I think that was a big thing, message to you there. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, I must be wrong because I'm a bad guy. See, this is, of course, very common among uh, Islamic apologists that they say, well, you see, Spencer, you know, he's full of hate and uh, so on and so on, which, of course, is a judgment that is at, at very least unproven. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know these people personally. They're only repeating what they've heard from smear groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center, things like that. Uh, and it's just a, it, that also is another fallacy that if, if uh, it's of course the argumentum ad hominem, the ad hominem attack, what it really means is you're saying this guy is wrong because he's evil. Yeah. Well, I may be evil, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm wrong. Evil yeah. people can actually be right about things. Ah, <laughs> <clears throat> oh, okay, let's go on. What I think has happened in the case of uh, Robert Spencer. Okay, this is about you here. Go. So, in any case, so the question he... is: Is what we know of Muhammad? dependable compared to what we know of other historical figures. So yes, much, much, much more dependable. And uh, he, much, much more dependable. He yes. himself in his book uh, admits that the gospels that we have of Jesus were comp compiled within uh, 40 <coughs> to 60 years after the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So that means in the late decades of the first century. And you better be careful. Forty years for the, first uh, the Quran says there was no the gospels, crucifixion. That means that for 40 years, uh, the Christian community did not have these written documents. So, how forty years, the Christian community did not have these written documents. This, is according to you, Robert. So, how yeah, this is, about of course, how false. Did I didn't say words. these things. How did they preach about him? And then, how did they preach about um, him? Uh, Christian scholars generally say that uh, the Gospels, as they now are written, uh, recollect not only what Jesus said, but the how he was being preached about within those that that 40 year again steve uh, yes i just want to say that you notice that he's done another thing that's a very common tactic and that is changed the subject now when the first edition of did muhammad exist came out and i was on a lot of shows very very often i found it strange people would say well can't you say the same thing about jesus and i said yeah you there should there are historical inquiries about whether jesus existed and what he said really and so on and that's perfectly reasonable to have and some of them might be right some of them might be wrong but nobody's threatening to kill the people for doing it and <clears throat> what he's done here though shabir is shift the attention away now he still hasn't given a single reason for why muhammad existed or why the quran is reliable except arguments from authority but now he's changed the subject and is trying to say that the Gospels are on shaky ground historically, which, of course, he's wildly overstating the case, and that, therefore, we should not be concerned about the Quran and Islam being on shaky ground historically. But it's just changing the subject. What I would always say on these shows was, Jesus might be completely made up. Jesus might be a total legend, a total myth. But that doesn't really have anything to do with this question. It's a different guy. Yeah. And you can't just say because one existed, the other existed. They don't have any connection to each other. Yeah. And so, because we both think of them as the founders of religions doesn't mean that they follow the same trajectory or that the same thing happened in both cases. So it's like when people say, 
well, Islam, yes, teaches to kill people, but look how bad Christians have been in history. Well, yeah, okay, maybe Christianity has been the worst thing ever in history. It doesn't have anything to do with whether Islam teaches to take wage war against unbelievers or not. Well, you, you know, I'm just going to, I'm sure you know this already, but I'm just going to say what he's going to do here now. He's, and this is the, what I think is the, is the worst thing he does. I mean, he's, he does a lot of bad things in here, but that he's going to say, well, see, the Quran is more authoritative because it was done within 20 years of Muhammad's death, whereas yes. the Bible was like 40, 60 years after Jesus. So the, the, the Quran is more reliable. That's what he's going to do right now. So. Right. But yeah. remember, he doesn't have any, any records at all that the Quran actually existed 20 years after Muhammad's death. There is no sign of it. And they're conquering, the Arabs are conquering everywhere, all over North Africa, the Middle East, and into Persia and so on. And nowhere do they, do, do, and people write about them and say, and they, the, 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 the Hagarians, the Tayyaye, they never called them the Muslims, came out of Arabia and they're conquering everywhere. And they never say, nobody ever who writes about this at the time it happened, says, then they say they have a new holy book and a new religion and a new prophet. Nobody, not once. You see, that's okay. Let's, let's hear him here. With this. <laughs> so, it, by comparison, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, giving us the Quran from the time of Uthman, uh, are giving us not the preaching of, of the community, but the precise words which they memorized uh, and, and wrote down from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So, that's very different because it, we, we do not have on record that anyone went about in the early decades of the first century uh, uh, memorizing the, the actual words of Jesus. And this is why we have so often the same words represented in different ways in the four Gospels, mm -hmm. because people captured the gist of what he said without uh, memorizing the precise words. So, you know, there's a whole thing there about the memorizing, you know, but... Yes. So then, why does he think that uh, the Prophet Muhammad is invented? I think this is the most important question. Yeah, and uh, he points question. to like bio biographical information and says that it, it came 125 years after Muhammad's death. He points to some coinage, inscriptions, things like that, that don't reference Muhammad. So maybe you can comment on some yes. of those things. So I started uh, referring to the fringe scholarship. Mm -hmm. in, in arguing that... Okay, back to the fringe, bro. Yeah, see, she, way, she, she is... actually gives two points there really very briefly that show that Muhammad is legend and not reality. I mean, she doesn't explain them very well or fully, but nonetheless, she's aware of the arguments against Muhammad's existence. She's asking him for help, and all he says is, oh, this guy's bad. He's yeah. fringe. The, uh, there's no substance to that at all. Pursuing uh, uh, lines of argument uh, presented by a fringe scholarship, and uh, more than there's a fringe again. This actually, he is putting together a mishmash of ideas that mishmash came from various <laughs> scholars who each, in their own way, is on a fringe. Each one of the scholars you use are on the fringe, bro. Yeah, I tell you, I don't know how we keep from falling off, or you know, right there on the ledge. <laughs> It's terrible. And uh, some of these ideas, in fact, were abandoned by some of the protagonists uh, who, who first put out these ideas. And he's still yeah, writing Steve, them. Yeah, Steve, yeah. he's right about that. Uh, I've got it right here. As a matter of fact, Patricia Crona, uh, who is one of the earliest people who started to question the historicity of the early Islamic texts, she wrote an article in 2008 where she says that uh, uh, we probably know more about Muhammad than we do about Jesus, and we certainly have the potential to know a great deal more. There is no doubt that Muhammad existed, and so on. Now, this was an extraordinary article because she was one of the first who cast large doubts on the canonical story of Islam's origins and Muhammad. But look, this is one of the things that she says, that uh, a Greek text written during the Arab invasion of Syria between 632 and 634 mentions that a false prophet has appeared among the Saracens and dismisses him as an imposter on the grounds that prophets do not come with sword and chariot. Wow. Now look, and then she says it thus conveys the impression that he was actually leading the invasions. Well, yeah, because actually it says that that the false prophet who has appeared among the Saracens is leading the invasions into Syria. And this is supposed to be after Muhammad's death. 
never names the document she's talking about, which is called the Doctrina Yaakovi, never names Muhammad. It says that the Saracens have a prophet, but it says that he's leading the armies in Syria at a time when Muhammad, according to Islamic tradition, has died. And it says that he's preaching the coming Messiah, which Islam, as you know, th that's not what it's all about, that some Messiah is coming. There are the stories about the Mahdi at the end of the world and so on, but that's not the, the focus of the message of the Quran. And so it's very clear from the Doctrina Yaakovi that it's not talking about Muhammad as we know him today. Wow. And that there are very serious problems with that because somebody, if Muhammad really had just died, why, do they, why are they saying he's still alive? And why are they misrepresenting his message? It's, it's, it's clear that it, it, that it may be one of the people who, whose stories were incorporated into the Muhammad legend, but it's not a reference to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And so Patricia Crona takes this and says, this is evidence that Muhammad existed, when actually it's evidence of just the opposite. opposite. And why she changed, I don't know. But it wasn't on the basis of the evidence. I don't know if maybe she was threatened or something or was facing professional difficulties because of this. But in any case, she never offers any actual good new evidence to go to 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 contradict what she had taught before. Well, you gotta know. I mean, just look at look at look what look what CNN's gonna do to her if uh, if she came out with something like that today. You know, look look what you know. Look at all the. Yeah things that they're going to do to her, you know, about this. And she did. She she wrote Hagarism with Michael Cook, and uh, it was the first, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it was the first book to attempt an alternative explanation of the origins of Islam based on the actual historical evidence. And she got uh, 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 incredible abuse because of it, and I'm sure probably threats as well. And so it's not in the least surprising that she would retreat. Wow. Wow. You see, that's, uh, okay. We, okay. All right. Let's go ahead and continue here. As the authorities behind, uh, who, who stand behind these ideas. Mm -hmm. l let me give an example. Uh, for example, he would say that, uh, there is no mention of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him on the f uh, early coins, which were minted in mm -hmm. the Umayyad uh, dynasty. Uh, well, th that's true. But, but what is the uh, reason for this absence of the uh, uh, mention of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Well, uh, a, a certain uh, scholar writing uh, in the collection by Angela uh, uh, Neuwart uh, and others. Uh, having a name like that helps because no one can pronounce it, so it must be important. So uh, Yeah, well, if we're speaking time. English, we can say Neuwirth. But uh, <laughs> the reality uh, is that once again, he's doing an argument from authority. See, uh, this German scholar says this. But that you notice that he admitted, and see, it's not just that the coins don't mention Muhammad. They don't mention Muhammad. They actually do mention Muhammad, but not as the prophet of Islam. Um, there are coins minted by the early Arab conquerors that say Muhammad, but he doesn't even acknowledge that, acknowledge that because he knows it's against him because they also have crosses on them. <laughs> now, why would the early Muslims, after they heard Muhammad say that Jesus was not crucified, but it appeared so to the Jews that they had crucified him, and that's in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 157, and they would know the, the, the Hadith where they would know that Muhammad had said that Jesus is going to come back and break the cross because it's an insult to Allah. Why would they go then go and make uh, coins that say Muhammad with a cross? Unless maybe Muhammad, once again, is being used as a title in this case, a title of Jesus or a title of some other Christian, and th that it refers to that as the, that person as the praised one. But it clearly could not refer to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. It doesn't say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. It just says Muhammad. And it's got the cross, which a, 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 a Muslim would never put on a coin. And it's on public buildings as well from oh. that era. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That's it. Text. Um, Heidemann. Heidemann writes uh, about these coins that uh, the, uh, the early Umayyad caliphs did not find it necessary to produce their own coins. They were just simply using coins that were already available from, from the uh, That's Roman. That's not true. Uh, 
they minted plenty of their own coins. There's a, abundant evidence of that. There are, it's readily available that the, uh, the, the Byzantine Empire that had ruled North Africa and the Middle East before the Arab conquests, they had their coins. And yes, the Arab conquerors did use those coins, but there are also mints that were in, uh, in Egypt and I believe also in Syria that minted coins for the new caliphate. And they, they're not Islamic. Wow. Yeah, it's like uh, he comes up with these little shallow, little, you know, bumper sticker cliche arguments, you know, but no evidence or proof or anything. But uh, Empire. Uh, and though they established their own Islamic State, they didn't see that it was necessary to have an empire, mm -hmm. an Islamic huh. empire that... That, see, that, that sounds real good for uh, CNN, too. So. Yeah, they didn't need an empire uh, because we know how peaceful and cuddly Islam has always been throughout history. Uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. That's the first thing that they did have was an empire yeah. and actually fashioned the religion afterward. And they made it martial and belligerent and aggressive and expansionist because it was the kind of religion you would expect warriors to put together. Wow. Right. Mints its own coins. And uh, uh, later on, when they will try to mint their own coins, they found from experience that they minted a gold coin, for example, and because it did not bear a cross, uh, it could not become popular among Christians. And they wanted the coins which were already in use and which were already popular. There was no need to change. It, That's I, ridiculous. I kind of think he's trying to get to something that you said already. Yeah, yeah. he's because trying to explain why they have crosses on them. But crosses. the idea that the conquerors were accommodating to the conquered people has never, read my book, The History of Jihad, never in 1400 years, ever, else anywhere else in the world were the Islamic conquerors ever uh, so accommodating to the the people they conquered. What they did was subjugate them as dhimmis, uh, make them uh, uh, pay the tax, the jizya that's specified in the Quran, 929, and make them submit to various regulations and humiliations and so on that were codified in Islamic law. The idea that they would uh, uh, do something that they thought was an abomination because the cross is an insult to Allah, remember, in order to accommodate the conquered people, it, it, Muslims have never behaved this way. Just the opposite. Wow. You yeah. <laughs> know. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, the law, Islamic law regarding the conquered people, the Dimmis, which is supposed to come from the Pact of Umar, the second caliph, 630s, and he says that the non-Muslims cannot make public display of their religious festivals or their religious insignia. And that's why churches in the Middle East don't have bells, because they can't make any public display of their religion. And so it's the same thing in this case, that they're, they're telling the Christians, you can't make any public display of your religion, but we'll put crosses on the coins. It doesn't make any sense. Wow. Wow. Dude, that just takes you in so many directions there. But, uh, you know, I think that he is right there predicting, you know, yes. like he's predicting that, oh, we got an issue because we've got so many different Korans. Let's go ahead and say right at the start, you know, we've got these different, but they all go back to our men, you know, and so that way he's trying to, uh, you know, pre uh, to preempt yes. you know, the what's going to happen, you know, but, okay, let's see. Change them. So what uh, these um, fringe scholars are, are saying now is that look at these coins. You're back, you fringe. Oh, yeah. They are more like Christian coins. Maybe he means French, I don't coins than Muslim <laughs> coins. And that means that Islam as a religion did not really quite exist. Let me and see and, and what they're saying now is that look at these coins. They are more like Christian coins than Muslim coins. And that means that Islam as a religion did not really quite exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe Muslims were a sort of Christian at this time. And, and Islam would really come later. And when they uh, come up with the idea of Islam, then they would invent its founder, the Prophet Muhammad. But this kind of conspiracy theory... Uh, uh, conspiracy theory. See, and once again, name-calling. He hasn't given a single piece of evidence this whole show to support anything he said, other than to name authorities that he says, uh, say what he says. But now it's a conspiracy theory.
bias, first rejecting uh, the Islamic evidence. And Re rejecting the Islamic evidence. What evidence? You haven't given us any. Okay. That, see, that's rejecting. You know, I want to hear that again. I just want to hear exactly what he says there because that's kind of a. Uh, the Islamic evidence. And, um, but this kind of conspiracy theory uh, uh, requires first rejecting uh, the Islamic evidence. It requires rejecting the Islamic evidence. And, and start with a blank slate and then start with the blank slate. just coming up with some ideas based on some clues here and, and there. But we cannot do history like this. Uh, you mentioned the biography. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is true that uh, biographies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were written some 125 years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The earliest Thanks, one we know now, or we have in our hands, is that by Ibn Ishaq, as edited by Ibn Hisham later. Uh, but uh, there were also biographies written earlier, at least uh, some compilation uh, of information regarding some of his expeditions, the Prophet, peace be upon him's expeditions, such as by Musa ibn Uqba. And some scholars have done some detailed studies on this recently, such as Gregor Scholler, and they have shown that... I was, fact, I was talking about Scholler before, Steve, that he's the guy who says, oh yeah, uh, Orwa and these other people, they got these traditions right from Aisha, right from people who knew Muhammad. But here again, what Shabir is not telling you, what Gregor Scholler doesn't deal with, is that we don't have any record of these early historians that's before the ninth century. That uh, if they did exist in the seventh century, we have to believe that their teachings were transmitted without any alteration, with exact recall, and that they, did, they, they were able to do this for 200 years. Because there is no contemporary evidence of any dis, any uh, uh, people who knew Muhammad or knew the Sahaba, the companions of Muhammad. There's no evidence, no no writings from them at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is some reliable information within the biography, so you cannot just simply throw out all of the biographies. It is true that the biographies contain some later myths and legends and so on as well, but you have. To the biographies contain some later myths and legends, okay. ...to be wary of, but that does not mean that you throw out the baby with the bathwater. Dude, dude, what did he just do there? <laughs> well, he's what he's saying is he's, he's trying to disarm the counter-argument. He's trying to say, well, yes, there is some legendary material, but there's still a kernel of truth. The thing is, there's no way to tell. If you go into Ibn Hisham, the, the biographer of Muhammad, the ninth century biographer, He's got on one page Muhammad doing things that are uh, well known as part of his biography, like uh, digging the trench around Medina to fight the Battle of the Trench with the Meccans. And then next page, he takes his pickaxe and swings it and he hits a rock and lightning bolt strikes. Uh, and he says, this is predicting the conquest of Yemen. And he does it again, and another lightning bolt strikes, and this is the conquest of Syria. And he predicts all the Islamic conquests that happen after, supposedly happen after his death. And so you see, you've got things that are taken as historical fact right next to legend, but there's absolutely no way to tell in the text itself what the difference is. There is no way for people, like you take Montgomery Watt. Montgomery Watt is a, a an English, a Scottish historian who... Uh, is not mentioned, He at least Shabir hasn't mentioned him so far. And he writes this big biography of Muhammad that's based on the early Sira literature. And he makes it, he tells the standard canonical story, but he ignores all the legends or the things that are so obviously legendary where the trees pass by Muhammad or Muhammad passes by the trees and the trees say, greetings, O prophet of Allah, and all these crazy stories like that. And he has, on what basis does he reject those and accept some others? Just because he likes them or yeah. he thinks they're more reasonable. But there is nothing within the text itself that can, gives you any way to distinguish what's historical fact from what's legend. You see, that's, that's what I'm thinking with his example of the, uh, of the bath, mm -hmm. baby in the bathwater. How do you know yeah. the baby from the bathwater? That's right, you don't. What you've got is uh, a bunch of sludge in the bath water, bathtub and he's saying there's a baby in there don't throw it out but it's you, it's just a bunch of sludge you don't see any baby in there at all well baby yes 
Wow, okay. <laughs> and you, you don't take any of the core information. William Montgomery Watt as well. Oh, look at that. Along. What? what? I yeah. just talked about him. <laughs> Similar lines and showed that, in fact, uh, uh, it, it, there must have been some dependable information. When, for example, a battle has been fought and there are slain uh, soldiers and uh, there are family members now celebrating that we are the descendants of those slain soldiers and there are many such persons now you cannot discount all of them there could be some false claimants but the basic idea that there are fallen soldiers and we are the descendants that is a basic historical fact oh come on uh, steve and many other scholars Hold on like just a second. i don't <laughs> want to prolong this unduly but i gotta say that's ridiculous you know have you have you ever seen pictures of the ayatollahs pictures of the the ruling mullahs in Iran. Actually, yeah. some of them are not ayatollahs, but they have some of them have the black turban and some of them yeah. have the white turban. The black yeah. turban means they're descended from Muhammad mm -hmm. and the white turban means they aren't. But it's all just which ancestors are liars and which aren't because <laughs> Muhammad was not a Persian. Muhammad was, was supposed to be a Southern Arabian, although the, the Arabic of the Quran is actually a Northern dialect not, that was not spoken in Southern Arabia. So that's another problem. But we've got, uh, we've got descendants of Muhammad, people who claim to be descendants of Muhammad in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in Iran, all over the place. And, you know, it's remote. It's possible, of course, that they traveled all over the world. But isn't it much more likely? that people get ahead in their societies so they would claim this and how's anybody going to know we don't have ancestry.com in the eighth century we can't tell who was descended from who <laughs> well you know the uh well the king of jordan is a hashemite you know which is one of the uh yeah you know, descendants and so uh, yeah he's one but i've I, i've no other i know i knew a guy from uh i knew a guy from uh pakistan and he was his last name was actually like Qureshi, you know, like uh, Nabil yeah. Qureshi. And he said he was a descendant of Muhammad too. And so there's It's possible. It's possible that Qureshis moved to Pakistan. Or it's possible that some Pakistanis thought, hey, uh, let's call ourselves Qureshi and say we're descendants of Muhammad and we'll get ahead. I wonder if I could start something by uh, I, I know I'm going to get in trouble. I'm just saying this is a joke, you guys. Don't, don't, don't say oh steve throw him off the cliff or whatever i already have people want to do that but, uh that nabil Qureshi was a descendant of muhammad but anyway not just okay. kidding you guys just oh kidding. i am steve i am i i'm gonna wear the black turban i'm descendant of muhammad <laughs> oh you are too <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah and they kicked you out of turkey huh <laughs> <laughs> well they didn't know if they'd known <laughs> they would have made me the uh the the caliph of the muslims if they'd known <laughs> All right, let's hear this guy here. Lecker, for example, in uh, the Cambridge Companion to Muhammad, uh, writes that uh, there, there is a historical <coughs> core, which we can definitely um, decipher. Uh, it, uh, Robert Spencer also relies on uh, uh, Michael Cook uh, and, and, um, uh, and Patricia Crone. But Patricia Crone and Michael Cook, though advancing some of these ideas in, in their book Hagarism, in which they first threw out all of the material from Islamic sources and they went with information that they can glean from other such circumstantial evidence like coins and so on, uh, they first advanced this idea that Islam came later and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was invented in retrospect. But they have uh, since then uh, rejected the very idea. And now it's funny, it's very Steve. Strange. I haven't, I, I watched this eight, ten years ago, whenever it came out, but uh, I haven't watched it since then. And it's funny how uh, I, he's saying the same things I expected. And I already answered about Patricia Crona that there's no real evidence that led to her changing her stance. Anyway. I know it's like Robert Spencer are referring to these as the scholars who stand behind this idea. They no longer stand behind this idea. They have discounted this idea. So con to conclude then, Muhammad did exist. Yes, to, yes. And, and according and, to many. According to Muslim scholars and according to uh, the consensus of non-Muslim orientalist uh, academic scholars. All right, thank you for that. Orientalist. You're welcome. We'll That's it. usually a bad word among uh, Muslims. They call you an orientalist. It means you're a bad guy. And now he's invoking them as authorities. What? This is an interesting guy, Shabir. Yeah. It's like when I listened to this, I thought, you know what? The girl seems to be... You know, really concerned about this, and I wonder what she thought. 
after this uh, interview, did she think, well, he settled the question or did she see through that he really didn't say anything at all? Well, I wonder if she sees that with everything she does with him because he's yeah. all this way. He never, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I did a, a program about apostasy. If I'm, if I'm supposed to be, to be killed or not. And, and, and I came to the end of it and I still don't know if I'm supposed to be killed or not. <laughs> well, you know, Steve, it's funny. Um, I don't watch Shabir Ali, but I do know that that she is no longer the host of the show. And wow. he's got somebody else who's the host of the show. And I wonder, you know, I, I wish her well. I hope that she's seen uh, the light and left Islam, but uh, uh, I also helped. hope she's safe. Yeah. You know what, though? I, I'm serious. She does. She really did ask some questions. Yes. I'm sure that they sat before and she said, this is what I'm going to ask and this is what you're mm -hmm. going to ask. But just the fact that because she does ask some very good questions, you know. Yes. So that is his daughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That as is. far as I know, actually, uh, you know, what I do know is this, that his daughter was the host of that show. And then later on, it was another another girl. So I don't actually know if that was the, his daughter or if that was the other girl. I don't oh. know when the switch was. So I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. OK. All right. Well, uh, you know, since I do have you here, and uh, just for one question about what you're seeing in Saudi Arabia with the yeah the prince uh, uh, dumping ninety nine point nine 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 three percent of the hadith, and then Al Azhar coming out and saying, "Well, we need to be open minded about this." <laughs> yeah. Couple things about that. I thought it was a very interesting interview with the crown prince, but that he was very nervous about it that it was a wide ranging interview. If you watch the whole thing, they talk about a lot of different subjects. And in all of the other subjects, the crown prince looks very relaxed and in command. But when he starts talking about the reform of Islam, he starts doing this funny, odd facial tick, like, uh -huh. and he says a few things and then jerks his head up again. And it's a very strange thing. It made me wonder if, he had uh, somebody's there. Just give me a second here, my friend. He had a. It, it, it made me wonder if he was nervous that something was with, with his neck and what was going on here, because uh, he's talking about rejecting inauthentic hadith. Here again, it's double talk because Muslims already reject the inauthentic hadith. Uh, only only Sahih hadith and and hadith that are also in various other classifications that are considered reliable are normative for Islamic law. That's already the case. So if he's talking about reforming Islam by getting rid of the inauthentic hadith, he's saying we have to do what we've already done for 1,400 years. Well, it's already done. So if he's going to try on that basis to actually change some things that are taught, that's where it's going to be interesting. Wow. And it's clear that he's, he really does want to modernize Saudi Arabia and make it more attractive for investment now that the oil, the world's moving away from the oil-based economy. We'll see whether he succeeds or if he uh, loses his head over it. You see, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this is like this. He sounds a lot like Earthman, you know. He sounds he's sounding very Earthmany, and so <laughs> yes, so, uh, yeah. And then the way that El Azhar reacted, and, you know, yeah, I was expecting them to say absolutely not the word of Allah, but no, it's like okay, uh, you know. And I know. Well, see, they know what he really said when you read the watch the interview. He just says. We have to get rid of the inauthentic hadith. No Muslim could disagree with that. Okay. So Al Azhar has no problem with that at all. But it really depends on what exactly he means by that. Because if he doesn't do anything about it, I mean, if he follows exactly what he said, he can, he's not going to do anything mm -hmm. because it's already done. There is there are no Islamic laws based on weak hadith. Okay. Sharia is based on strong hadith. Yeah. So. Uh, we'll see if he claims that other things are on a weak basis and gets rid of them. And then other people will protest because if the Hadith are strong, supporting those practices, he won't be able to get rid of them. All right. Well, Brother Robert, thank you uh, so much for coming on. And uh, thank you. It's like uh, every now and then you get one of these interviews that are just like uh, very meaty and very, it's like you addressed every single thing. And then you also showed us. It was which is uh, very interesting for me. I'm not a big philosophy person, you know, but the the actual strategies that he's using, like the different kinds of arguments, the uh, appealing to authority, and you know, all these things that he did mm -hmm. 
to avoid and the fact that he didn't answer one single thing. Yep. You know, this I, is how Islamic apologists always work. Mm -hmm. They change the subject. They claim they make arguments from authority and claim that you're just some fringe lunatic. They uh, they use argumentum ad hominem. They call you names. They say that you well fringe and hate filled and everything else. Racist. But they never they they can't refute you on the basis of mm -hmm. the facts. I mean, they know that you know the Quran does teach warfare against unbelievers. The Quran does teach hatred and violence. So what are they going to say? They have to just hope you don't know that. And if you do know that. They're going to say, "You're well. You're a bad guy, and that's why you're saying this." Islamophobe and so, yeah. which, uh, <laughs> all right, man. Well, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get that Quran uh, as soon as you get. Well, that's I can't get it till November, right? You yeah. can pre-order it now. It's it's available now at uh, various online bookstores, and you could order it if you want to go to your brick and mortar bookstore. I'm sure they can order it now because it is listed. It is available for pre-order. Okay, awesome, and. Uh, you know, it's so funny, man. It's just like, because, you know, I never even thought about this possibility that Muhammad didn't even exist. And and when I first heard it, I thought, oh, please, you know, it's just like, come on. That's, it's like, you know, we've done everything to, <laughs> to him. Just let him at least exist. But then when you start looking at the reaction and you yeah. start looking at the, the, the evidence and everything, it's just like, you know what? This is coming. This is this is coming out of the fringes, man. This is going in yes. the mainstream, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens now. You know, in terms of the reaction, you know, to try to keep this myth alive. So, uh, anyway, thank you so much, brother, for coming on. God bless thank you. you. I, I hope to have you, you on again, and and I'm hoping we can talk about uh, your next book too, which is uh, I'm very excited about. Yeah, me too. Great. I look forward to that. All right. God bless Thanks you. A lot. You too. You have a wonderful day. And thank you. thank you, everybody, for who was with us today. We had a pretty good crowd today. Praise be to God. And uh, and also, remember, especially if you're not a believer, say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Yesur sa'idni. Yesur samihni. Yesur udkhul albi. He loves you. We love you. Have a wonderful day.